Jungle Deep, 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 the podcast that explores the tropical lifestyle. Hello, and welcome to the podcast, Jungle Deep. This is your host, Dr. Jones. We are on safari, and I'm here with you to learn, to have fun, and to explore the jungle. for joining me for this episode. In the wake of the centennial celebration of the Tarzan character with a multi-day conference in Tarzana, California, some of the participants are reflecting on the meaning that Tarzan has held for them and their career choices. As we noted in previous episodes, Tarzan's centennial guest of honor, famous primatologist Jane Goodall, credits Tarzan with her desire to originally go to Africa and study the apes. Well, another conservationist of note, and also a primatologist, is the president of Conservation International. His name is Russ Miedermeyer, and he too is a lifelong Tarzan fan. On a recent blog post, he says, quote, Ever since I can remember, I've been interested in wildlife and travel to remote and little-known places. When my first grade teacher asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I answered, a jungle explorer, which in modern terms would best be translated as a biodiversity conservationist. <laughs> but he says that more than his frequent visits as a child to New York City's Bronx Zoo and the American Museum of Natural History, the other much stronger influence was his early encounter with Tarzan. He says, the book Tarzan at the Earth's Core, quote, for me is the single most important book that I ever read, end quote. Considering just how many books a man like Niedermeyer must have studied in his 60-year lifetime, that is quite a statement. Says Niedermeyer, but far more important than the impact of the Tarzan legend on my life has been its major role in bringing the jungle, now known more correctly as the tropical rainforest, to the attention of the world. In many ways, Tarzan was the first rainforest conservationist, protecting the forest and its animals against hunters, trappers, and other forms of exploitation from the outside world. He was truly a man ahead of his time. For myself and many of my peers, Burroughs works have provided so much more than entertainment. They have inspired careers that have helped to shape the modern conservation movement. And these stories were an inspiration to many people in the middle of the 20th century who went into rainforest research and conservation as a profession." End quote. So there you have it from people who know. Tarzan is not to be taken lightly. It appears that he has inspired a great many natural scientists in the generation that grew up with his books. So how about you? Was Tarzan an influence upon you as a child? Did he play a part in your choice of a career? Or do you think this Tarzan love fest is wrong-headed? Let us know. Call. Leave a message at our blog. Or shoot me an email and join the conversation. I have another Tarzan announcement. To commemorate the 100-year anniversary of the first Tarzan book, 
The U.S. Postal Service has launched a new postage stamp celebrating the beloved character. The stamp shows a profile of Edgar Rice Burroughs and an image of Tarzan with a leopard skin loincloth clinging to a vine in a tree. You can see an image of it on our website. Next, we are going to hear from our field correspondents, Kelly Patterson, reporting on tropical foods, starting with chocolate. And then we will talk again with Stephanie Arney on part two of our discussion about orangutans, this time featuring Rusty and Violet of the Honolulu Zoo. Today I am pleased to announce that we have Kelly Patterson with us who's given us a report uh, from time to time. She's our field correspondent about exotic foods and drinks. Kelly, I want to welcome you to Jungle Deep. Thank you. Glad to be here. We're so looking forward to what you can teach us about fun foods and drinks that originate in the tropical rainforest. And and you've picked as your first topic <laughs> something that's a big hit. It's just a huge hit, isn't it? <laughs> that's right. Ta-ta- chocolate. Chocolate. Yes, chocolate. Yeah. And chocolate's a, chocolate's a real big deal, isn't it? It is. Everyone loves chocolate. It, well, practically everyone. <laughs> it's a huge industry. It's a huge industry. It really is. I know a little bit about the history of chocolate. Do you want to tell us where the heck does chocolate come from? Well, if you're a chocolate lover, you may tuck into a box of truffles or grab a candy bar on the run, but did you know that this decadent treat not only originated in the rainforest, but was neither sweet nor creamy for centuries? It wasn't sweet. Yeah, no, it wasn't sweet. The Theobroma cacao tree, from whence we get chocolate, is native to the South American rainforest, and it is believed that the crop moved north through trade with the Olmec, Mayan, and Aztec people. For centuries, it was used in a bitter beverage reserved for royalty, priests, decorated warriors, and the like, and was widely used ceremonially, and it also had great value as currency. So this goes way back to the, oh, yeah. uh, as I understand it, to the Olmec people, the, which are, I think are believed to be the first Mesoamerican civilization. Right. And, that, and, and my notes indicate that's, uh, that goes back to 1900 B.C. Right, So yeah. chocolate has been around for a very long time, and obviously uh, it's been popular all that time. Exactly. Wow. Well, exactly. So what is it exactly? Where does it come from? Well, making chocolate is a, quite a time-consuming process. First, cacao beans are removed from trees with a pole or machete. And after sifting for foreign objects, the beans are roasted for up to two hours, and the outer shells are removed, leaving us with a product called cacao nibs, which are crushed to create a product known as chocolate liquor, although it actually contains no alcohol. Hmm. From here, the process depends on the type of chocolate being made. For cocoa powder... The liquor can be pressed, removing the fat and cocoa butter, and ground into powder. For chocolate candy, sugar, milk, vanilla, and the like are added, and the product goes through a process called conking, which was named because the first machine resembled a conch shell, Hmm. and that mixes the chocolate. And then cocoa butter and soy lecithin are added for a more creamy consistency, and that process can take days. And finally, it's cooled, and voila, you have chocolate. Wow, so it starts out in these pods that grow on these trees. Right. And by the way, I understand these trees are really rather sensitive trees. That is, they, they do require a tropical environment and a high humidity, and you can't grow them in, in the average American backyard very well. They really require a tropical environment. They're not very big trees. They're, they're considered trees of the That's- understory of the forest. So they're not canopy trees. These are kind of short trees that live in the understory. They actually like a little shade. So they like the warmth and the humidity, but they also want some shade. So they're really kind of particular. And then they grow these pods, which are funny-looking things. They look like footballs. They come in different sizes and uh, colors. But uh, generally, most often, I think they're probably uh, orangish in color or amber in color. And they hang on the trunks of the trees, not up in the branches like you think of most fruits doing or most pods doing. They do put out flowers first. And then they, uh, they I, I read somewhere they put out, uh, well, thousands of flowers, but only a few of them actually turn into pods. And then you get maybe a dozen or so, or maybe a couple of dozen pods on a single tree. 
Ah, here it is, 6,000 flowers on a single tree. <laughs> but they only get about 20 pods, and they're about a, they're about a foot long and like four yeah. or five inches in diameter. In average, they vary quite a bit. And out of these funny-looking pods on these little trees, we get this amazing product called chocolate. And then they have to go through all those steps. I, I, it was interesting for me to learn that there's actually, well, several products, several things they get out of these beans that they take out of these pods. That You mentioned the liquor, the, the cocoa butter, and there's cocoa solids. And then what kind of quality of chocolate you end up with has everything to do right. with the proportions of these, how much sugar and how much fat and how much... Uh, uh, real cocoa butters in there. Obviously, the I think don't they say that the, the more of the the original cocoa solids and cocoa exactly. butter that's in the chocolate, the higher quality chocolate it is, isn't that exactly? Exactly. I think that's a tendency. Of course, you don't. I, I've never seen a candy bar with a rating on it about content. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you have to judge by the price and, of course, the the the, the flavor, exactly. the, the taste of it. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So how much of this stuff do we have? What else can you tell tell us about? And I think it's odd. Isn't it odd that the scientific name is Theobroma cacao, but uh -huh. we all know it is cocoa. <laughs> I know. I, I guess I, I, I mean, cacao is still in use in certain instances. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's mainly known as cocoa now. It's like somebody somewhere along the way got their O's and their A's exactly. mixed up, but um, and, and now and now we use both. Exactly, both it just things. ran with it. And, oh, that scientific name, by the way, Theobroma cacao. I know means food of the gods. Right. It was named centuries yeah. ago, and yeah. uh, and and back then they considered it the food of the gods. Of course, I guess those ancient yeah. civilizations used it at, like for money. It, it was something of value that they. Yes. Yes, it was. Yeah, it was so currency. common and, and yet valuable that they could. <laughs> it seems a little strange, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. For centuries, it was just the wealthy who had access to chocolate. And so, what else do you have for us on this chocolate stuff? Well, um, today chocolate is it's still um, an eighty-three billion dollar a year industry worldwide. Eighty. Three billion? Three billion dollars a year. And Whoa. in the U.S., approximately 5% of the yearly sales of chocolate occur during the week of Valentine's Day. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's no big surprise. <laughs> yeah, and um, approximately two-thirds of the world's chocolate today is grown in West Africa. And the West, as you were saying earlier, since it requires, you know, this certain kind of environment the rest comes from countries in south and central america and asia regions near the equator mm -hmm, mm -hmm. unfortunately kind of the dark side That's... um there have been issues recently surrounding you know issues in the industry like slavery child slavery unsafe working conditions but Happily, a number of the major chocolate producers are working with trade groups and farmers to eradicate these issues and create safe and fair working conditions for laborers. Yeah, I do believe that's the case. I don't have a picture as to how much success they've had so far, but they are actively working on that, on educating these people, uh, you know, providing education for them yeah. and a better, uh, trying to provide a better standard of fit, uh, living because uh, most of the cocoa is produced by farms that are small farms. 90% uh, of them are family-run farms. So it's a lot of, well, a lot of poor people in poor countries that are producing this chocolate. And as it is, with all that they produce, it's 3 million tons of cocoa beans annually that they produce for the entire world. You know, the U.S., the Europe, and the Asia, yeah. and so, uh, the whole yeah, world loves this stuff. And they're just able to produce enough to satisfy demand at this point in time. If they don't have bad weather or whatever, these trees are kind of temperamental. They're sensitive to insects and diseases, funguses, and, and weather patterns too. And I fear what global warming is going to, uh, you know, the way it's kind of scrambling the, the weather patterns around the world. I foresee times when chocolate may become scarce and high priced and I hope that doesn't happen but but it it may be inevitable I don't know but yeah these families these um I don't know I I I've read that in fact most of the chocolate is produced <laughs> in Africa now even though it's an Amazonian it came from the Amazon South America where the the, the trees came from originally 
I don't know why so much of it has moved to Africa, but Africa's like 73% right. of the world's producers are in Africa. Why take it all the way over there to grow it in the jungles? I, I think part of that is, is in fact, they, they have a labor right. force there that, as you mentioned, they've taken, in the early days, took really cruel advantage of, I guess, and are really cheap labor there that's, uh, I think, more institutionalized and maybe more organized than, than what they could do in South America. But I suspect that's only part of the answer. And if anyone out there is listening uh, can uh, shed light on this, uh, I hope they'll uh, either give us a message in our blog called The Jungle Vine or even email us and, and uh, shed light on, on that. But luckily, it's got the attention of the industry, and they're working on, on improving that situation. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's been around for so long that, you know, change will probably not happen quickly, but you know, hopefully it will happen. Well, they, I, there's part of it is they realize that in order to be, I think industry is starting to realize that in order to be sustainable, it has to be good. It has to be healthy. It has to make sense. And they're not going to have profits in the right. future if they don't take a sustainable approach to it. You know, I mean, they're, they're, it'll get out of balance and exactly. they'll lose it. They'll, they'll lose money. They'll lose business. Well, let's talk about something more fun. Okay, do you tell us anything about what kind of things is chocolate used in? Well, I have two recipes for you. Oh, goody. I have a cocktail <laughs> that I like to call Tarzan's Love Call. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> and, and that and was... This, a, hmm? this is a, ch a chocolate cocktail? Yes. yes oh, how fun. Is, yeah, it, it's very easy to make. Um, you combine two ounces of gold rum, one half ounce chocolate liqueur, such as Trader Vic's is, makes one that's very good, hmm. one half ounce pineapple juice, huh. one half ounce fresh lime juice, and one dash of chocolate bitters. And a couple of companies that make chocolate bitters are Fee Brothers and The Bitter Truth. Mm. You just combine all those ingredients with ice and shake it in a cocktail shaker and strain into a cocktail glass. All there is to it. And then look out. You'll be serving Tarzan's Love Call. Tarzan's Love Call. It's very good. I do say so myself. <laughs> if you're with a Jane, you better look out. He might get jealous. That's right. <laughs> you could show up suddenly in your tiki bar. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's well, that, that's it. Now that's interesting. Now, where the heck did you get a Tarzan's Love Call chocolate cocktail? I made that one up myself. It's your own invention. That's well, my here, own it, invention. right here, an exclusive on Jungle Deep. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, an exclusive creation on jungle deep we've got tarzan's love call that's amazing all right but now you know we, we probably have some listeners no doubt that are uh you know really shouldn't be drinking cocktails do we have anything for them we do here's a chocolate pie that folks of all ages can enjoy featuring a tropical touch of fruit hmm. and this you can either make your own crust which i have a, a coconut crust that's easy to make or you could just start with a pre-made crust if you don't want to do any baking at all. Oh, but a coconut crust, that sounds good. I don't think I've had a coconut crust. That sounds like a really good idea. That would be good with chocolate. This is a chocolate cream pie? This is a chocolate cream pie. And for the oh. crust, mm -hmm. combine one and a half cups of sliced coconut and two tablespoons of melted butter in a pie plate. And you just press it into a crust shape. Bake it for 15 minutes at 325 degrees or until slightly brown. That's hmm. all there is to it. You, you, you can actually make a crust out of, uh, out of just coconut? Yeah. Oh, cool. I never wow. even thought of that. Don't well, Kelly, you. that's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. That's, that's why we have you here is to educate <laughs> me. All right. Okay, let's go. What's it, how else do, what do we have to do to make this pie? Okay, and for the filling... All you do is combine one-third of a cup unsweetened cocoa, one and a quarter cups sugar, one-third cup cornstarch, and one-quarter teaspoon salt in a saucepan. Turn the heat to medium and slowly add three cups of milk. Bring that to a boil, reduce the heat to a simmer, and stir for three minutes. After that, remove it from the heat and add one cup each of dried pineapple and dried cranberries, or you can substitute your favorite dried fruit. Hmm. Pour that into your cooled pie shell 
and refrigerate for three hours. That's it. Wow, that'd be fun. That's And that's certainly different. That's different than any cream pie I've had. That I'm looking forward to trying that. <laughs> it's really easy. <laughs> yes. It's, uh, it's, it sounds doable. I think I could handle that. <laughs> well, Kelly, that's amazing. That's great. Well, thank you very much for this. We're going to have you back on a regular <laughs> basis, I, and we're going to be talking about other kinds of foods. And this uh, this sounds like a real good one to have, especially if you plan to invite Tarzan over for your... <laughs> For your jungle party, for your luau. If you can get him to show up, I think he'll be happy with this. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) And all the little Tarzans running around, they'd probably love it too. (laughs) (laughs) Something for everyone. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, uh, that's terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you. And how can people learn more about you? Let's be sure to tell them, Kelly, how if if they want to learn, because I mean, this is something you'd do really well and you do a lot of you can help people you got all kinds of recipes on your website tell our listeners uh, how they can learn more about uh, kelly patterson and all her creations that's right well my website is www.velveteenloungekitchen.com and i'll spell that out b-e-l-b-e-t-e-e-n-l-o-u-n-g-e-k-i-t-f-c-h-hyphen-e-n.com Terrific. And folks, of course, we have that on our on our website as well. We have links to Kelly's website, so you can uh, reach her that way too. Well, thank you very much, and we'll talk to you again, Kelly. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Bye-bye. Bye. You are listening to Jungle Deep. 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 This is Kelly Camille Patterson of the Velveteen Lounge Kitchen, and I make my lime fellow marshmallow cottage cheese surprise while listening to Jungle Deep. Hi, I'm Al Bowl, film producer of Tars and Lord of Louisiana Jungle, and I clean my lenses while listening to Jungle Deep. Aloha, this is Marty Lush from the Tikiaki Orchestra, and when I'm not vibing with the band, I'm listening to the vibes of Ken Jones and Jungle Deep. Hi, this is your host, Ken Jones, from the Prince of Ponds podcast. The frogs are shaking the shakers, the turtles are hitting the slapsticks, and the koi are blowing the trumpets. It's party time at the Prince of Ponds. Out under the swaying palm trees, the pond fairies are kicking up their heels, spinning in delight in the twilight. It's time to celebrate the magic of ponds, waterfalls, fountains, and water gardens at the Prince of Ponds podcast. This is Dr. Jones. I invite you to visit a website to learn about a tribute underway for one of the world's most beautiful natural places, Yosemite National Park. Masters of their craft, the Polsons are creating gorgeous murals of stained glass representing the four seasons of Yosemite, and their project is soon to be a campaign at kickstarter.com. You can take part in this historic art project and participate in the creation of this awesome exhibit honoring Yosemite. If you love Yosemite, you will love the Four Seasons of Yosemite. Learn more at www.williampolson.com. That's William, W-I-L-L-I-A-M, Polson, P-O-U-L-S-O-N, dot com. Now, more of Jungle Deep. Deep. Joining us today is our field correspondent on zoo and wildlife news here at Jungle Deep. She is the wildlife educator and outreach coordinator for the Great Honolulu Zoo, and that's Stephanie Arney. Welcome to Jungle Deep, Stephanie. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> now, this is part two of our discussion on orangutans. We, we're going to get specific and personal with Violet and Rusty. So, so tell us, Stephanie, who, who is Violet and Rusty? <laughs> Violet and Rusty are our hybrid orangutans that we have here at the Honolulu Zoo. Now, what I mean by hybrid is that they are a mix between the two different species of orangutan, Bornean and Sumatran. Now, most zoos are big fans of hybrid animals because we cannot join them into our breeding programs, which is a significant reason why we have zoos. But we love Rusty and Violet. We have a great history. I'll tell you their stories but our entire community is in love with them. And today I wanted to be able to share why we are so in love with them and why they help us create awareness, um, conservation awareness and wildlife awareness um, within our own communities. So I'll start with the fact that Rusty, once again, is a hybrid. 
and he was born at the Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle and then was given to a substandard roadside zoo. You know, at the time, Woodland Park Zoo didn't, wasn't aware of this. They didn't, you know, don't want to give any harsh comments about that, but they were, he was given to a substandard zoo. And the people in that area did not feel very comfortable with the zoo. It was not accredited with the American Zoological Association. So by route from the Orangutan International Foundation got word of this and she convinced the owner to release him into her care. She then researched many different possible locations where he, where he could live all over the world. And for that, for that time period, he stayed at the LA Zoo, and then he came to the Honolulu Zoo, where we welcomed him in with open arms. He lived here in an exhibit and received excellent care from our staff for probably about 10 years. Mm. And in those 10 years, almost all the future homes, the possibilities of these homes fell through. So Beirut and our team here at the Honolulu Zoo and the Oahu community raised a whole lot of money to create a large exhibit for Rusty. And we're very thankful for the OSI and all of our key donors to make this possible. So Stephanie, how old do you think Rusty is? We're guessing Rusty is 32 years old. And, and Violet is, how old is Violet? Violet's a couple years older. She's 34 years old. And this actually is a great introduction to Violet, because as soon as Rusty got his exhibit, we realized that he probably needed to have a little, some company. And so Violet was transferred from the San Diego Zoo at 34 years old to come and be Rusty's partner and best friend. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm guessing by their ages that they're very mature apes at this point. They're very, very mature. And like I said, they... Uh, orangutans typically live about 35 to 40 years in the wild, but within captivity, it's about 50 years. And of course, that's because of the care that they receive. They're not worrying about any natural predators or, of course, humans cutting down their rainforest. So right. they, and they have vets there. They have doctors that are protecting them. They sure, they have their doctor. own doctors. They don't get that kind of health care out in the wilds. No, now, they don't have <laughs> they don't have Obamacare out there. <laughs> <laughs> now Rusty, I imagine he's got those big wonderful cheek pads that orangutans have, right? Yep, flanges, yeah. Those are amazing. I it, yeah. what are they for? What are those things for? Before you go on, I just I've always wondered, what the heck do they have those big wide cheek pads on the males for? Well, you know what? The mature males tend to grow those. Their hormones will click in and they'll grow them and they show dominance and that they're a large animal and not to be messed with. Mm. Kind of reminds you of like a silverback gorilla, mm. right? So all the other males in the area, the larger the flanges, the more dominant that animal is. And of course, they get all the girlfriends in that area during breeding I season. See. So the, the... But also, <laughs> they can make calls. And when they make these really loud calls that you can hear over a mile away, it's kind of like when we put our hands over our mouth to project our voice. So oh. it kind of does the same purpose. Oh, so it kind of kind of helps project the voice. Absolutely. And, and it makes them sexy. And it makes them very sexy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think they look pretty darn scary, but... <laughs> Very good. I... And we always do remember that they still are a wild animal yes. and um, are extremely strong. I would say that Rusty is probably as strong as eight full-grown men. Um, and because of that, we don't go in and play with our mm. animals at the Honolulu Zoo because we understand they are a wild animal and that they are very strong and will protect themselves in any way possible. Yes, I've always heard that they're uh, strong as, well, I've always heard say as strong as seven humans. Yep, yeah, very tough. Yeah, they're pretty amazing. Well, tell us some more about them. Well, uh, when they first met, they uh, spit at each other. They looked at each other and <laughs> like, I don't even know who you are, but they just started spitting at each other. And that that didn't last very long. They, they went to opposite sides of the exhibit and smelled each other out, stared at each other. And then eventually, Violet passed him carrots. And that was kind of a way of making peace. Although Rusty was too nervous to take the carrots, but eventually they, become, they became friends and, with each other. Um, they did this by being very coy, is what the, the keepers like to describe. You know, Violet would steal Rusty's toys or paper or burlap sap, whatever he had that day, she would take it away, and then she'd turn around and look at him, and then Rusty would look at her, and then he would steal it back from her, and they'd look back at each other. So with some um, uh, flirting happening, eventually they became very close friends. 
And I wanted to mention some um, of the things that we do with these animals. Um, there's a very particular thing that we do with animals since they are in zoos to enrich their lives. And believe it or not, the word for that is enrichment. Uh, enrichment is pretty much it's a way for keepers to encourage and stimulate natural behaviors in animals uh, we, through sight, smell, touch, taste, and interactions that we have with them. It's constantly stimulating them. So things that we do with these animals can range from different interactions that we have. It could be giving them different types of toys, whether they look natural or unnatural, many different things. The idea for this is, is to make their lives more interesting and to stimulate the intellectual side of their lives and to elicit more natural behaviors from them, I imagine. Absolutely. They have 97% of the same DNA as us, and they're considered mm. to be one of the most intellectual apes. So we're constantly doing enrichment with them to stimulate them intellectually and, and emotionally and all those things, right? Physically, you want to get them active and climbing up in the trees so they're nice and healthy because we do want them to live up to that 50-year-old mark. So things that we might do with them, just mention a few of them. We have given them, let's say, pianos like a play school piano. Remember the really small yellow one with the colorful keys? Rusty loves instruments, and he loves creating sounds. So we'll put that next to him. And unlike a chimp or a gorilla that might just bang, 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 bang on it, Rusty likes to play each individual note. And his most favorite thing to do is play it with his tongue. Oh. And so just go, nip, 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 nip. Oh. <laughs> It's really funny to watch it. Well, I imagine his fingers might be a little big for the keys. <laughs> Maybe he needs to yeah, use his he, tongue. <laughs> his hands are huge. They're so large. And when we have a handprint from him and the kids put their hands down, their hand fits. It doesn't even cover the palm of his mm. hand. So that kind of gives you an idea of how large their fingers are, which are perfect, right, to help him climb around in the tree. So very helpful. And believe it or not, they have the same type of hands that we do. They have fingernails like we do, and they have all those grippies on their hands. And so it's, it's amazing to be able to see the, the comparison between us and this amazing ape. What are their temperaments like? Well, it's different every single day, Ken. <laughs> Some <laughs> days the keepers will come in, and they'll be waiting right there at the edge, edge of the exhibit and saying, hello, how are you guys? Good morning. Look at what I found in my exhibit. Um, look at how I'm, you know, building a nest. And some days they walk in and you can tell when Rusty and Violet have perhaps had a little bit of an, a tiff. And you'll see Rusty on one side of the exhibit and Violet on the other. And they're both, you know, looking at the keepers over their shoulders, being like, just frustrated. You know, you can, we're not, we don't like to be anthropomorphic and give, you know, give them human emotions, but the best that we can read that is that perhaps maybe they had some type of tiff over a thing, like a toy, for example, and um, other days they might not be as um, maybe affectionate or interested in the keepers, so they definitely do have their behavioral, different types of behaviors, but in general, Orientans are quite calm animals, and they they seem to be the wise and observing of all of the apes. Mm. They tend to sit down and stare at an item for long periods of time, studying it. It just looks like they're, they're scientists, and they're trying to figure out how did this thing get put together, and how can I take it apart, even more important. Mm. Uh, I've heard of a story once when I was in Borneo from a woman that was working with some of the orangutans there. She was telling me that a gentleman once left his camera on a railing, and one of the saved orangutans there in Borneo who was coming in and, and getting free food here and there but was now wild had got a hold of it and sat down on this platform and took every single part of that camera <laughs> apart down to the very last oh. screw. So when that man received that word, he was like, well, what am I going to do with this camera now? It's completely taken apart. Nothing was broke. They loved to take things apart. It's one of their most favorite things to do. We, we like to call them the little engineers. Mm. They seem to be calmer than uh, gorillas are or even chimpanzees. And I was wondering if in general they were, in fact, yes. a calmer animal. I, I understand now that, you know, I'm a little concerned for Rusty because... 
I, I can kind of relate. I think I've read that they're, the males orangutans are more solitary and spend a lot more time alone than the females do. The females tend to be a little more social. And I'm wondering if you, you're keeping Violet and Rusty together all the time, if Rusty isn't feeling like, man, his space is like invaded and he needs to have some of his own man cave time. Could this be a problem? Do, do you ever separate them? Does Rusty <laughs> ever have any any time to himself? Of the course guy? we do. Yeah, of course we Does do. Does he? <laughs> we do. And we do with a lot of our animals. Of course, the zoologists, researchers, and keepers here all are very aware of the latest research that is going on with animal welfare and, and knowledge of animal behaviors. And they try to keep true to that as much as possible. So, of course... Yeah, orangutans are semi-solitary. They come together when fruit is plentiful and they're, you know, they can socialize together and, and males. And then, of course, when the fruit becomes a little bit more scarce, they do separate and, and feed alone. And, and, of course, males do spend more time alone. And because of that, we do have separate bedrooms. Sometimes we'll put Violet in the back room and, and do some, let's say, target training with her where we'll get her to lift up her arms and open up her mouth so we can check her teeth just check her all, all around health and then we'll let Rusty be alone in the exhibit and he'll get his own time in his man cave <laughs> <laughs> and we do try to respect that as much as possible I also have to add they look like they need a good grooming do they groom themselves like other apes and, and monkeys do do they groom each other at all it looks like it needs a good brushing <laughs> um, <laughs> that's very true they have very long hair, and it's very, it has this oiliness about it, and that's what's perfectly adapted towards a rainforest. Living up in the mm. trees, it's raining all the time. So that yeah, water that can sense. just hit their coat of hair and fall right off. Unfortunately yeah. for orangutans, they still hate the rain, and they hate water, and that's why they do build nests that have, some of them, build nests that have roofs on them. And mm. it's no different for our animals, Rusty and Violet. When it rains, they want to put a sheet over them, a piece of cardboard, a burlap sack, um, a, a bunch of leaves over their head. They'll do whatever it takes to cover themselves. And that's <laughs> but we were like, well, why don't you just that's let them clean you off? But we will, <laughs> uh, the keepers will pull them to the side. And through a fence, of course, because we do not go in with our animals, they will pull out hair and in like grab chunks of it and soap it and clean it. And it takes hours. Rusty's hair is thick and beautiful when it is finished. In mm. the process of Rusty receiving a bath, Violet will sit to the side patiently waiting for her turn. We'll give her a cloth and it, she'll take that cloth and she'll clean up all the soap suds around the area. She'll sometimes <laughs> even suck it up, lick it up and drink it. And I've seen that mm. in a couple different videos of the orangutans where they, when they're taking baths, they'll imitate what we do. So if we lift up their arm they'll, and clean around our, our arms, they'll do the same thing as well. So they mm -hmm. do receive baths. When they don't, they get a little bit stinky, but they're used to that. <laughs> <laughs> but it is gorgeous when after they do receive a really detailed bath when they jump up in those trees and they brachiate from one branch to the next and all that beautiful red hair flows out. It's stunning, and we get huge crowds when that does happen. Yeah, I can imagine it'd be quite an improvement if they. If, I, I feel sorry for them that living in the rainforest and they don't like water. That's that's a real bummer. I know it seems odd, doesn't it? <laughs> but it they, certainly they're does. They're intelligent creatures, and they've created tools for survival. And one of those is learning how to create that that roof over their head. And I've heard of ones that were made so amazingly well that the orangutan comes out after a torrential downfall and they come out completely dry. So they're very good at what wow. they do. So some other things that we like to do to stimulate them is we'll hide their food throughout their exhibit. And being omnivores, we mostly put out fruit, but in the wild, they would eat a bird egg or an insect or a lizard here and there. But like I said, we put out a variety of fruits that we can grow within our own zoo grounds, living in the climate that we do. And that gets them up and climbing and moving and getting physical. And some other things that we'll do is we'll put out different brows. These are branches. And we'll watch them build their own nests. Sometimes in some zoos, they need to teach these animals how to do it. Believe it or not, orangutan mothers keep their babies for eight years, training them on how to climb between each tree, which fruits are good for them during which seasons, and how to build nests and how to protect themselves from predators. So unless we teach some of these animals how to do it, if they didn't learn it from their parents, they're not going to do it. 
So a lot of keepers and zoos will teach these animals how to build their own nest. So it's really fun to watch Rusty and Violet putting these sticks together to try to make it work out. We'll also give... Oh, I'm just going to make a note that uh, that's the longest period of time of, of any of the apes to keep their youngsters with them. That's longer than any other ape yes. does. That's a long time. Definitely. Yeah. It's a, eight years is a very They've got a lot to time. teach them. Yeah, there's so much to teach them. And that's also a conservation note that when orangutans are killed because of palm oil or their babies are stolen, whatever the situation may be, that orangutan only has a baby once every eight or nine years. So if they're losing a habitat and they don't feel safe, they're not going to have another baby. And we might be skipping generations, um, which definitely contributes to the decrease in the numbers of their population. Now, let me restate that because I think that's very significant and very, well, surprising maybe. It's an amazing fact that they, the females only give birth about once every eight years. That's the longest time between births of any mammal in the world. No wonder they're going to be, they're going to be slow in recovering from attack, from, from decimation. You know, it's going to take a while. Absolutely. And Ken, if one of the babies gets stolen, that female, the mother, it has been known that they go through such a traumatic experience that some females don't even have future babies. Wow. Because they're just so traumatized from the experience. Mm. Well, you did say something earlier about not wanting to project human emotions on these animals. And I don't know if there's ever been a study done about what other kinds of emotions there are, but frankly, I don't think of human emotions as being particularly human. I've been around enough animals to know, and I have a, a pet dog who's my constant companion, and I feel like we really do share the same emotions. I don't know that their complexity and uh, some of the intellectual stuff that yeah. goes with it, of course, is going to be very different, but uh, when it comes down to basic feelings, we seem to have the same. I think that if it comes down to survival skills, every living creature is going to do whatever it takes to survive, and whatever impacts them, and they're going to have a reaction. And I believe that we, we definitely do have some similar reactions, whether it's you want to put it as emotions, but we, I think we do have very similar emotions and, and reactions to other animals out in the wild. And it's hard to say. I think it's one of those arguments that I don't know if it'll ever be solved or not, but it is, to me, very surprising to watch a big ape, um, a, like, uh, for example, a gorilla or a chimp or an orangutan, watch their behavior and, and it is a little bit strange to see how you how much we have in common with them and i think that's our, the, our fascination with them right and that's part of the it's, fun of going to the zoo isn't it and exactly you know, yeah. being able to see these animals do these things so if you go into the zoo and you see what i what i've been saying is enrichment if you see things in their exhibit like a box or something high up in a tree or something hidden or maybe a toy. Those things could be natural or unnatural, but they're all there to stimulate the animal's behavior. So it's fun to see that. So when you do, sit and watch it and pay attention to the animal's behavior because that's what you want to see when you go to zoos. That's what makes you fall in love with them. And hopefully our sneaky little thing that we're doing is getting you to fall in love with them so that you help us help them out in the wild. Well, Stephanie, you've given us a lot of fun insights into the private world of Violet and Rusty, and I think we've gotten to feel like we know them a little better, too, and it's been a lot of fun. I want to thank you so much for your contributions here to Jungle Deep, and I look forward to hearing about what you come up with next. Thank you very much. Bye-bye now. Bye. Be sure to share Jungle Deep Podcast with your friends and co-workers. The show is my creation and at my personal expense. It is not currently subsidized by any business or organization. Audience growth is especially important for Jungle Deep to succeed and prosper. So share the show. You can see beautiful photos and learn more about Jungle Deep at our website, calaverasgold.tv. Now that's Spanish, Calaveras, C-A-L-A-V-E-R-A-S, gold. G-O-L-D, like the mineral, dot TV, like television. you got to check it out. Where else can you go for this kind of fun? Just click on the Jungle Deep title in the header directory. Our show notes pages have valuable links for you. 
I invite you to email me at jungledeep at calaverasgold.tv and follow me on Twitter. Search for Jungle Deep or Ken Jones 56, all one word. I would love to hear your ideas for the show. Well, the show's over for today, so it's time to refill my Mai Tai, mount my elephant, and head back into the jungle. Thank you.